Anthony Dunn is here. He is going to get a little bit hardcore about caching. So if you're interested, please welcome Anthony. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? OK. Hi, I'm Anthony Dang. I am from Sydney, Australia, but I live in London. And today I'm going to talk to you about caching. Um, I thought my talk was meant to be like an hour, so I need to rush through this. So I'm not going to talk about the stuff that I do. Um, I'll give you all a, a git crack and promo code at the end of this. So just to make sure that everyone is awake after lunch, we're going to start with some code. <laughs> Who can tell me what is wrong with this code, aside from the fact that it's PHP? <laughs> random number. So here we have a random cache time. Why would you have a random cache time in your application? <laughs> it's not what, sorry? It's not, it's not handled. Well, yes, it's not handled because it's random. Uh, developers love random time in their applications, don't they? Um, so yeah, huge problem in, in this application. So why do we want to do caching? Uh, I've seen many different implementations over the years, and this has prompted me to talk about caching. So typically, we want to do caching because we might have some limited bandwidth or availability of, say, for instance, an API or a database. Uh, the cost might be an issue. Has anyone dealt with the Google Maps API recently and the cost involved, yeah, it's kind of skyrocketed. So you might want to use caching to reduce costs. Uh, you might want blazing fast UX in your application, which is great. You can use caching for this. SEO, uh, Google requires that your web application uh, re responds in 200 milliseconds or less. Otherwise, they rank you down in a listing. And you may consider caching for poor, for poor uh, performance of your application. Um, I have some bad news for you. Caching is not the solution for poor for performance. You need to learn architecture. So, so different ways we can do caching. So I'm going to talk about Cloudflare, which is a proxy level cache. Uh, this, you can cache at the network layer with the CDN. You may consider caching at uh, your HTML output points. You may consider caching everything at the HTML point except for something. You may just want to cache something on your application. You may have methods in your application that you want to do caching with. You may have an entire service layer that you want to cache. You may even want to do caching at your data access layer, so maybe a, a code repository, uh, sorry, database repository. Perhaps you want to do some pre-indexing. Maybe you want some sort of multi-layered solution where you do caching at multiple points. First up, we're going to talk about CDNs, because I think this is the easiest thing to, to grasp. Uh, CDN is pretty simple. You upload some files, and the CDN sits in front of your application, distributes these files geographically closer to your users, so the user gets better experience, quicker downloads. In Azure, creating a, um, a CDN is super simple. In front of blob storage, you give it a name. You choose a resource group, and you choose a location. The location actually doesn't matter with the CDN. It's just there for some reason. Um, and then you choose a pricing model. In this case, I just chose the standard. And that's how you create the CDN. Um, and then you add a endpoint. So you add a name. You choose the type. In this case, I'm doing a storage CDN because I have blob storage. And then I choose my blob. And literally, that's it. Um, that's the entire thing. It's a no-code solution. It's actually quite nice. Um, and this video was going to talk about the different options in here. But basically, you don't need to deal with the options. Uh, typically, you can just leave it. Uh, if you want to do caching by query string, you can. Um, but I'm just going to skip over this next bit because we don't have much time. So let's see this CDN in action. Here is the blob storage up here. And the other tab is the CDN endpoint. So this is actually in Eastern Australia, and we'll see how long it takes to get the file down. It's a pretty large file. It's about four or five megabytes. Um, and here we can see it takes six seconds, but I decided to keep reloading this so that we can 
see whether it's actually a network issue or whether it's a blob issue. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, blob storage is notorious for being unpredictable with its, um, its response time, which is why having a CDN in front of it is advisable if you're relying on speed. So here you go. Here's the CDN. And we have this at under four milliseconds. Uh, not, I'm sorry, under four seconds. So this is about 20% faster. So success, we have better user experience for our users. And that's quite consistent, under four seconds. So the other one was just under five seconds. So let's talk about what's going to happen when you need to update things in your cache. In this case, we're just going to drop a file in. We're going to overwrite it. Refresh the blob storage version. And you'll see here is a different koala, a lazier koala. Um, but let's take a look at the, the CDN version. It's still cached. So this is this is a, um, this actually illustrates caching problems very well because you'll come across these type of situations all the time in your application. Now, in an emergency, you could go to the portal and you could just purge your cache. But do you really want to have to go in and manually? purge the cache every single time. Um, ideally, you want to do this via an API, which Azure does have, um, via code. Um, but that can be problematic. So things to consider when you're dealing with cache in general are, when will the cache time out? Um, sometimes you can just wait. Uh, does anyone know the default cache time for CDNs in Azure? It's seven days. So, <laughs> um, so if you're dealing with legal documents or medical documents, things that require you to update things pretty quickly, then you need to consider uh, how you're going to clear your cache very quickly. And there are packages out there, or you can write custom code yourself. Uh, but then this becomes an issue because now you have to deal with configuration and deployment on, of configuration or deployment of code. Uh, so you have to think: is is it acceptable to have stale content? It might be for some situations. Uh, or you might want to reduce your cache time down to maybe one hour so that you can have these acceptable bounds. Um, so the other thing is, OK, uh, how do you get your files up there to begin with? Do you FTP them? Um, well, if you're using blob storage, you're probably doing some sort of deployment, or maybe it's via the application, via the API. Um, but then is this, is this a no-code solution anymore? You, you're, you're adding code to upload it. You're adding code to clear the cache. Um, maybe it's not a no-code solution. It depends on your scenario. Um, then there's browser caching. So if if you need to upload an image, people's browsers will cache this image as well. So then you have to think, OK, how am I going to bust the cache on the user's machine? Well, typically, you can do something like um, adding a query string to the end, so maybe a version. So if you're caching something like uh, CSS or JavaScript files, this is, a pro this is a problem. You need to now add cache busting to these files. So these are some things to consider. Next thing I'm talking about is Cloudflare. So Cloudflare is a great solution. Uh, it's one of my favorites. You basically click around, and that's it. It's, uh, it's a really great developer experience, and they, they really nailed it. And it solves a lot of the problems that CDNs have. So let's take a quick look on how you can add a page rule. So all you do is create page rule. In this case, I have dangeasy.tech, and I'm just going to cache everything. So slash star. I'm going to pick a HTML, uh, uh, browser cache time of four hours, and then a few more settings. cache everything, and then the edge cache of the Cloudflare network. That's it. That's all you need to do. It's, it's actually a wonderful developer experience. So let's talk about that cache refreshing issue again. Uh, here we have a live website, which is Dang Easy Tech. And we also have access to the Azure 
app service directly via the via its uh, Azure um, domain. So in this scenario, we're going to break the navigation. So both of these are the same, as you can see. Go into the Embraco back office. Uh, I'm an Embraco specialist, so I'll use Embraco. I'm going to simulate a crash. So we go to the Azure website directly. We have an error in the navigation. OK, but there is no error in the live website. So that kind of seems good, right? OK, but what happens if at 3 AM the cache time's out and you're in bed? Well, your public users will suddenly experience this error. But you thought it was fine when you left for work, right? So let's see what happens when you need to fix this at 3 AM. Let's fix the error. Maybe you do a deployment. Back to the Azure site. Azure site's working. Cool. Public site. The error is still there. It's because Cloudflare has cached the error. So, OK, what do you do? <laughs> Seriously, what, what do you do in these scenarios? You have to basically uh, check everything manually, and then you have to go into Cloudflare and, and clear the cache. Or you could do it via an API if you're doing a deployment. Now, the problems with external cache solutions is they tend to hide downtime and crashes. So your entire website could have been down but Cloudflare would have still served it, which is potentially a good solution. But wouldn't you want to know that your website went down? So now you need to add monitoring so, so you know whether things have gone down. But how do you know if just a widget has gone down, or the navigation, or a promo item? How do you detect these things? You could deal with some Selenium tools, which may do some, some sweeps of your website. but that's, that's a whole bunch of code that you have to write just to detect whether something has crashed. So this isn't really a no-code solution anymore. Um, and another issue is you do have limited page rules with, uh, with Cloudflare. You, I think you have about 100, and then after that, it's one USD per page rule. So if you need to add more page rules, you need to f think of different ways to do this caching. The other issue is security. Um, if you're dealing with... Uh, sensitive data or maybe user login data, you now have to consider the fact that you don't want to cache everything. You want to cache some things or maybe some pages, but not every single page. Or you cache by session or by, by some other parameter, but it's not just as simple as caching everything anymore. You now have to consider your architecture. So just quickly on Varnish, um, has anyone not heard of Varnish before? few hands. Okay, Varnish is basically a hosted uh, uh, proxy solution. It's very similar to Cloudflare, but you host it yourself on a Linux box. Um, it has basically unlimited rules, and you can configure it to any length. It's quite crazy. And what's also crazy is the configuration file. Yep. Some cookies. Um, some file extensions. I uh, don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Nope. Don't know what that means. Some more extensions. Something to do with a cookie. Apache. And yeah, so this looks like it was made by a Linux developer. Um, <laughs> because no one, no one can understand something like this. So unless you're a Linux developer and can understand things like this, don't touch Varnish. Um, if you're going to deal with Varnish, don't host it yourself. Uh, you could consider something like Fastly. It's a hosted solution. And so you will get all the control of this configuration file if you want this pain. But, uh, but don't host it yourself, because then you'll have to manage a, a, um, a Linux server. But in my opinion, Cloudflare is probably a lot better for um, most scenarios. OK, that was the easy part. Now we're going to talk about code. This is an MVC partial in C Sharp. Uh, it comes off the Embraco documentation. And essentially, all you're doing is uh, you're caching the output of, of a partial view with this cached partial um, method. Can anyone tell me what problem there might be in this code? <laughs> 
It's not the model, by the way. The timeout. The timeout is hard coded. So when you hard code timeouts in cache, what are you actually doing? Well, you need to consider how you're going to clear this cache. Uh, and how do you turn it off? You can't. Uh, what are you doing during development? Are you having your cache turned on all the time? If you are, then how do you know if your application is performing well? Maybe you've written some really horrible code that performs really badly, and when you start your application, it's slow, but you think, okay, I'm just in development mode. My machine is slow. It's not the real server. It's okay to be slow the first time. So this is actually hiding your slow code. You need to be able to turn off your, code, your cache during development so you can see if your code is fast or not. So now on to output caching. <clears throat> um, is anyone here not a C-sharp developer? I didn't actually ask that in the beginning. OK. <clears throat> oh, half the crowd. <laughs> OK. Uh, so but I, I assume that most of you understand MVC. Uh, basically, you have a controller, and you're going to output cache the controller HTML. So in this scenario, um, you'll have similar things in PHP and, uh, and other frameworks, but basically, uh, here is a method, or the main method of a controller, and you're adding an attribute which, which will cache the output of that method when it's being used, when it's rendering for the end user. The great thing about this is you can cache everything, and you can just uh, select, uh, select different ways that you can do caching, add some cache duration. You can set this to zero if you wanted to, or you can actually just turn off the whole thing. So this solves some great problems. However, uh, when you're caching everything, you have to remember the things that you don't want to cache. So you, you don't want to cache everything all the time for the same reasons as maybe you have a user login and you're showing their, their email address. So some pages you won't want cached. Or maybe you want to just cache some things on the page or most of the page. So this brings me to, oh, also, um, it's also harder to figure out performance problems because if you're code is caching very close to the user, but your performance problem might be down at your data layer, how do you actually figure this out? You need to be able to turn this off, and perhaps you want to cache closer to the problem. This brings me to donut caching. So with output caching, you were caching the entire page. With donut caching, you're going to cache everything except something. Simple concepts, um, which means that you can cache everything except a whole bunch of things. So th this isn't actually donut caching at this point. It's more Swiss cheese caching. But um, the principle is basically the same. Uh, this is C sharp. You don't have to really know about it. But you're caching everything except for a few things. So here I'm just saying, OK, exclude this thing from the cache. And there are all different packages across the different, uh, different platforms that will allow you to do this. But the biggest problem about this is you have to remember to punch the holes still. Uh, and it's still not close to the problem because you're caching everything so close to the user and it's going to be hard to diagnose things. Which brings me to donut hole caching. So perhaps you want to deal with caching things close to the user, but you want to cache just some things on, on your page. In my opinion, this is much nicer because now I'm explicitly caching things. I'm not going to make a mistake of accidentally caching something. Well, it's, it's highly unlikely because I know the things that I want to cache. I'm not going to cache everything. So it's basically the opposite of donut caching. And here's a quick example. I'm just going to cache something on the page. But again, it's actually not caching close to the problem. And you don't really have that much granular control because you're so close to the user. Again, maybe your problem is deeper in your application. Which brings me to some custom caching. You don't really have to understand this. This is basically um, some tree crawling in Umbraco. But basically, I'm just going to get a node, so a piece of content in Umbraco, and I'm just going to get the children. You don't, don't have to understand the, what's happening behind. But assume that this is performing badly. We've all seen code that performs badly. but um, but then you may think, OK, I'll add cache to this, right? So you'll probably see this all around your code. You'll create a cache key. Uh, you'll try to get an item from cache. You'll check to see if that 
item is null or empty or something. If it is, then go, go do the, the difficult thing, the thing that's not going to perform very well. You get a result, and then you add that to cache. And you're thinking, yes, I've, I've solved the performance problem, right? OK, there are a few problems with this. This method is no longer single responsibility. You've now added an extra step to this method. You're not only getting the data or the values that you need, but you're also doing caching. And you'll be very, very tempted to use this pattern all around your code. So if you're sprinkling this pattern everywhere, check if it's in the cache. If it's not in the cache, go get it, then cache it. Then it's going to be very hard to figure out where things are cached and why things are cached in your application. So you're basically sprinkling it like mozzarella cheese all around a pizza. You're not really thinking of where it's going. It's just everywhere. And eventually, it just melts in the oven. And you don't know why you've done it, but it kind of works. So it's hard to diagnose problems. And you don't know where your cache is. It's not in one place. So this brings me to a really cool thing that I've been doing in the last few years. It's using interfaces and dependency injection to cache an entire service. Does anyone, uh, is anyone not n um, aware of dependency injection? No hands. Good. So on the right-hand side, we have an interface. On the left-hand side, we have two classes. Uh, one uh, is a CMS service. The other one is a cached proxy. They both implement the same interface. So as far as your application is concerned, it's dealing with interfaces, not concrete um, implementations. Now, registering this in your application at startup, perhaps you're in development mode. OK, well, if, if your cache service is not enabled, well, just use the, the one that's going to perform badly, just so that you know what your performance is going to be like. And then if it's enabled in your production environment, say, then instantiate the cached version. Pretty simple concept. The, the end result is that your original method stays the same. It's clean, still single responsibility. Then your cached proxy ends up passing through to that original method. So this is the thing that does the caching. All we're doing here is creating a cache key and then passing that to the cache. It's a, this is a really, really nice way to do things, because your original method stays clean, and all of your caching is now in a different class. But it's the same interface. Your application works the same. And if you want to clear the cache, uh, you'll probably have some events in your application. So when you're up updating content, you can remove all the cache in one go. So in this case, I've removed everything based on the, the name of the class that does the caching. But you can do things in different, different ways. But there are some problems with this. Uh, the learning curve for this can be quite difficult if you're not used to dependency injection. And this, is, this doesn't seem like a very common way to do caching, which I think is a shame, because it is using dependency injection and interfaces for what they were intended for. So if you're not using, uh, if you're not using cache in this way, definitely consider it, because it solves a lot of problems. Your IOC uh, initialization can be bloated, but hey, you, you have to have some way of swapping things out. Um, some of the methods in your services may just pass through. So there's always going to be some scenario where your cached proxy just needs to pass that method call through to the concrete implementation. That can be OK, or it can be quite messy as well. If half of your methods now no longer require cache, then maybe you need to reconsider your architecture. So this is not necessarily the, the best solution. And uh, well, there's no way to manually clear the cache either. So you're going to have to write some code somewhere to manually clear the cache. Or it might be acceptable just to restart your web application. It depends on your scenario. So you have to consider these things when dealing with cache. This is deeper in your application. Now we're talking about uh, the repository pattern at your data access layer. Now, this comes straight out of the source of Umbraco. And frankly, this just looks complicated. Uh, whether you're a C-sharp developer or not, this looks 
very daunting. It's totally abstracted, and you have this pattern here that I talked about before. If it's in the cache, then get it. Otherwise, if it's not, then do the hard work. The, the problem with dealing with uh, caching at this level is you may have to deal with, um, obviously, all the previous problems, but you may have to deal with stale entities. So if you're doing a get, OK, it's coming from the cache. If you're doing a write, well, the cache needs to be updated. Well, what about a concurrency issue where something else is doing a get? Are they getting the cached version from before or the new version that you just updated? Can your application now tolerate stale entities? You have to consider this. And it's also very hard to distribute. So if you're dealing with uh, many instances that are updating your database, well, OK, just take two, two for now. One is doing an update, and it's updating the cache. OK, great, so the cache over here is updated. But the other instance has never been told, hey, update your cache. So again, you have some stale entities on this side. So doing caching at the repository layer can be very, very problematic, and you have to be very careful to deal with these scenarios. And this is one of the reasons why Umbraco's back office is not uh, able to be distributed at the moment. So they need to unwind this somehow. So consider your architecture. Um, I'd, I'd highly recommend not, uh, not doing caching at the repository layer unless you really, really have to. There's other options. All the, other, all the other options that I was talking about. Now, you could take this to the next level. You could decide to do your caching externally using something like Redis or maybe some sort of external database. Um, uh, Redis is great. It is basically a key value store. You throw it some data, and it just, and it just gives it back to you really quickly. It's, it's really simple. There are many APIs that you can use. And it's a great alternative to using your application's internal memory cache, because now this is somewhere else, and your cache is now a centralized thing that you can use with all the other um, instances of your application. And it's great for large amounts of data. However, when you're dealing with external things like this, you have to consider costs. Now, I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but uh, the cheapest one is about 15 pounds per month. So that's 250 megabytes, but that doesn't seem like very much data, I think most applications will need to cache something uh, much higher than this. So say, for instance, six gigabytes, OK, well, that's about 120 pounds per month. OK, your clients can definitely afford that, unless you're dealing with um, cafes or, or, or small businesses. But as you grow with your data usage, well, 53 gigabytes is actually over 1,000 pounds per month. And you have to consider whether this is actually worth you caching externally. The other consideration, other than cost, is, well, you have more infrastructure to deal with. So how do you deploy this? How do you maintain it? And you have to worry about its uptime. In the case of Redis, its uptime is 99.9%, .9%, which works out to be about 43 minutes per month of downtime. Uh, can your application deal with outages of a few seconds, few minutes here and there. These are th some things you need to consider. Let's talk about a real world scenario where this is multi-layered. And this is a project that I inherited which caused a lot of pain. Basically, there was a Varnish instance on a VM, a web application on another VM, you had uh, a third VM, which had a MariaDB and a PHP data API. But this also had a Varnish instance on there. So here are the cache times of the different cache points. What was the actual cache time for this whole solution? Can anyone tell me? <laughs> it, it, it's, yeah, worst case scenario, it's like 26 and 10 minutes-ish. So here you have some cache at about 10 minutes, but you actually end, your end user result is going to be the combination of all of those, because if you're really unlucky, all the cache will cascade. So your end user will have to wait 26 
rough hours to, to see a, an updated cache. Okay, the other consideration, how do you clear this cache for your end user? Painfully, yes, painfully. Uh, basically, there's no way to do it nicely um, because you're dealing with internal memory cache. Okay, well, we already talked about having to write some code to do that or maybe restart the application, but this is a data API. You can't just restart a data API, right? You have to write some code to clear the cache. Okay, the varnish solution. Well, you could create a cron job, right? Okay. Uh, but then you have some internal cache over here. So how do you synchronize the fact that you're going to clear this internal cache, this internal cache, this varnish instance, and this varnish instance all at the same time? It's virtually impossible. And this solution had so many problems with cache being stale uh, that uh, basically we had to just rip out most of the cache. So what was the actual problem that they were trying to fix with all these caching layers. Well, the actual problem was over here at the database, the tables and the data was too complex. So they were trying to do queries which was taking way too long to execute. The whole thing was just way, way, way too slow. So they added all these layers of caching and they thought, okay, caching is the solution. But actually it caused all these problems. A better solution would have been something like this, to pre-process the complex data and put it in some sort of index. So here we are. You have the data import into your database, some sort of pre-processor using a search index. You might choose to use Azure Search, Elasticsearch, um, maybe some sort of document DB. But at least you know that this data over here is going to be quick to access. And then your web application can just access it. So you don't really need caching at all in this scenario. You might have added a little bit of caching here and there just to improve performance, but, but the bottleneck, which used to be at this database over here, no longer exists. So this was an architectural choice that they made. However, if you're adding more infrastructure, you now need to consider the cumulative effect of the SLAs and the downtime. So if you add one extra piece of um, infrastructure, well, if assuming it's 99.95% .9 uptime, you're looking at about 21 minutes per month downtime. You add another one, and you're looking at about 43 minutes. And you, look, you add a third one, you're looking at about one hour and five minutes. So every bit of infrastructure you add can actually <laughs> add to instability and downtime of your whole solution. This is a real pain, and your application needs to be able to fail over very easily, or at least fail gracefully, or recover from these scenarios. Also, clearing multiple layers is super, super painful. So if you're dealing with multiple layers, you really need to figure out a way to do this. Um, I haven't come across a nice way to do it. I try to keep my layers as, uh, as small as possible, just one layer or two layers of cache. The other issue with this scenario was uh, would have been if we did the pre-indexing is how do you keep your pre-index up to date? Well, if it's something that can be imported once a day, then that's fine. But if it needs to be live, well, you need to think of different ways to do it. Perhaps Redis might have been a better a better way to do it. Do the pre-processing, put it into Redis. It totally depends on your scenario. So uh, to recap, we've talked about Cloudflare, CDNs, Output caching, some donut caching, caching just the donut hole, caching methods, which I definitely do not recommend, service layer caching using uh, dependency injection, talked briefly about the uh, problems with repository layer caching, uh, pre-indexing and multi-layered solutions. So my recommendations when it comes to caching is basically you don't need to cache everything. And caching is basically your last resort. Try to fix your application first. But if you do need to do something to do with caching, then consider pre-processing and, and indexing before you start doing live caching, uh, assuming your data is really complex, that is. Uh, you definitely need some way to automatically and manually clear your cache. Perhaps the manual clearing can be an application restart, if that's acceptable. 
Otherwise, you're going to have to build something into your application, maybe uh, some sort of API endpoint that you can hit if you're authenticated and it clears the cache, or something from uh, a back office user that, that has a button. So avoid caching everything because that causes problems. There's always going to be something that you cached that you were not meant to cache. And if you're dealing with legal scenarios or medical scenarios, then, then you don't want to cache everything. You want to be very specific with your cache. Ideally, cache, cache close to the problem so that you know that if the cache is in front of this method or in front of this class, then, you, then everyone knows and all the new developers know this is the this is the junk code that might actually cause some problems. Don't cache everywhere all around your solution. Try to keep it isolated. And definitely keep it simple and obvious so that the next developers will actually understand your code and why you've chosen to cache in certain ways. The multiple layers of cache definitely causes multiple headaches. So try to keep your layers as, as small as possible. So one or two layers is ideal. If you're dealing with four layers, then it's, it be, the problems become exponential. And remember, there's no perfect solution when it comes to caching. There's only trade-offs. And it really depends on your situation and, and your product and your clients and what can be tolerated. So can you tolerate stale entities in your application? Is that acceptable for your end user? You have to think of these scenarios. And that's me. Thank you. That was really helpful. So we have time only for one question. Who is willing to ask it? OK. First, thanks for the talk. It was amazing. Um, I have one short question. You you shown that uh, Cloudflare is better than Varnish. But um, my question is, how do you maintain your Cloudflare config configurations? I mean, the Varnish config is hard to read, but at least it is in a GitHub repo, so you can see all of the changes that has happened during the last months of it. But Cloudflare is some dropdowns, and if someone changes any of those dropdowns, what happens then? How do you debug such a problem? Is there any history or? How do you debug it? Um, okay, uh, so a couple issues. Uh, firstly, how do you uh, how do you deploy uh, a configuration for your cache? Is basically uh, what we're asking here. Um, so with Varnish and and the hosted solution Fastly, you have the configuration file which you can upload. In Cloudflare, you have an API that you can use. So you can have uh, you can have a script of just curls that that hit the the Cloudflare API. Um, in, in the case of a user going to the back office and changing something, well, that's that's life. <laughs> uh, I, I think there is a trace log somewhere, but I've never needed to use it. Um, the same thing happens with with Fastly. A, a person can go into the back and just click around, and then then your configuration is not matching what's stored in your repository. Yeah, that's life. Okay, so one more time, thank you, Anthony. It was a great talk.